Hello, everybody. Good evening and welcome to the virtual home of the Princeton Public Library here on Crowdcast. My name is Madeline Rosenberg and I'm the Public Humanities Specialist at the Princeton Public Library. It's my pleasure to host tonight's program, Poets at the Library. This program is presented in partnership with DVP US One Poets and with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. I'm just going to pause for a second here and say that if there's any issue with the audio or visual, um, please put something in the chat so that we can address it. Um, and there are also some buttons at the bottom of your screen that allow for Crowdcast support. Tonight's featured readers are David Cruz and Isabel Bay Gonzalez. I'll introduce both poets before the readings begin. They'll read for about 20 minutes each, and after they've read, we'll have an open mic with those who have signed up in advance to share one poem. I should also note that this event is being recorded and our events typically go up on the library's YouTube channel. Another quick housekeeping note, um, we recommend that those using Crowdcast use it in a Chrome browser if they are able and try not to have more than one tab of Crowdcast open at the same time. And I would actually recommend that you close out any other tabs that you don't need, um, especially ones that might play video or audio to have the best listening experience. So our first reader will be David Cruz. Cruz is a writer, editor, and wilderness advocate who resides in southern Vermont, the ancestral lands of Mohican and Abenaki people. He cares for work that engages a reconnection to land and place, wilderness, preservation, and nonviolence. He currently serves as managing editor for Wild Northeast. He is the author of Wander Thrush, Lyric Essays of the Adirondacks, Raw Press 2018, and High Peaks, Raw Press 2015 a poetry collection that catalogs his hiking of the Adirondack 46ers in upstate New York. New work can be found in The Hopper, Rewilding Earth, and Writing the Land. After David reads, we will have Isabel. A Newark native, Isabel received her BA from Rutgers University, an MFA in poetry from Drew University, and works as the assistant director, sorry, I lost my place for a second, as the assistant director for the poetry program at the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation. Gonzalez has received invitations to attend Vona, Tin House, Ashbury Homeschool, and Boat Press workshops. She's a Contamundo Fellow and has been published in Patterson Literary Review, Tinderbox, Journal, Anomaly, Vinyl, Waxwing Literary Journal, and others. She's the author of Wild Invocations, Get Fresh Books, 2019. So I'm now going to minimize my screen and mute myself, and I'm going to welcome David to the stage. So please join me in welcoming him virtually. All right, I guess I'm on. Uh, Madeline, thank you. Uh, Princeton Public Library, uh, US One Poets. Um, for everyone being here tonight, it's really wonderful. And of course, Isabel, to share this evening with you. Um, you know, I feel very grateful, so thank you. Um, I'm gonna read some work from a new project tonight. Um, when I moved up here into North Country, I found a mountain that is uh, quite a charming mountain. Um, here's a little sketch of it. It's uh, Mount Monadnock, and it's located uh, in Southern New Hampshire, just outside uh, the town of Dublin. What are ancestral lands and the home today of Abenaki peoples and uh, Penacook Kawasuk tribe. Um, and it is a mountain that um, has a lot of history uh, some some research I found on the internet uh, is that it's one of the most heavily hiked mountains in all of the world, and that when Mount Fuji built a road to the summit of um, the mountain there, Mount Monadnock became the most heavily hiked mountain in the world. You know, at least this is what the internet says. Um, it's a very accessible mountain. It's only about two hours outside of Boston. And it has incredible views. When you get up to the top, you, you get above tree line. Um, the mountain's only 3,100 feet, uh, but it has an alpine environment. Sadly, it's because uh, colonial settlers twice uh, burned the summit and the, and the substrate never came back. Um, but as far as a mountain to hike and climb, you know, the views when you get up top are just spectacular and there's all these different trails. Um, so I can see the allure of it. And of course, um, you know, I've been working on this project all year now, so it's been quite inspiring. I wanted to start off and <clears throat> read a poem by Galway Cannell, who actually has um, a whole collection titled 
flower herding on Mount Monadnock. And um, I'm going to read the title poem uh, from that collection. <clears throat> flower herding from Mount Monadnock. One, I can support it no longer, laughing ruefully at myself for all I claim to have suffered. I get up, damned nightmare. It is New Hampshire out here. It is nearly the dawn. The song of the whippoorwill stops and the dimension of depth seizes everything. Two, the song of a Peabody bird goes overhead like a needle pushed five times through the air. It enters the leaves and comes out little changed. The air is so still that as they go off through the trees, the love songs of birds do not get any fainter. Three, the last memory I have is of a flower which cannot be touched, through the bloom of which all day fly crazed, missing bees. Four, as I climb, sweat gets up my nostrils. For an instant, I think I am at the sea. One summer off Cap Ferrat, we watched a black seagull straining for the dawn. We stood in the surf. Grasshoppers splash up where I step. The mountain laurel crashes at my thighs. Five. There is something joyous in the elegies of birds. They seem caught up in a formal delight, though the morning dove whistles of despair. But at last, in the thousand elegies, the dead rise in our hearts. On the brink of our happiness, we stop like someone on a drunk starting to weep. Six. I kneel at a pool. I look through my face at the bacteria I think I see crawling through the moss. My face sees me. The water stirs the face, looking preoccupied, gets knocked from its bones. Seven, I weighed 11 pounds at birth, having stayed on two extra weeks in the womb. Tempted by room and fresh air, I came out big as a policeman, blue-faced with narrow red eyes. It was eight days before the doctor would scare my mother with me. Turning and craning in the vines, I can make out through the leaves the old shimmering nothingness, the sky. Eight, green scaly moose woods ascend, tenants of the shaken paradise. At every wind, last night's rain comes splattering from the leaves. It drops and flurries and lies there, the footsteps of some running start. Nine, from a rock, a waterfall, a single trickle like a strand of wire breaks into beads halfway down. I know the birds fly off, but the hug of the earth wraps with moss, their graves, and the giant boulders. Ten. In the forest, I discover a flower. The invisible life of the thing goes up in flames that are invisible, like cellophane burning in the sunlight. It burns up. Its drift is to be nothing. In its covertness, it has a way of uttering itself in place of itself. Its blossoms claim to float in the Empyrean, a wrathful presence on the blur of the ground. The appeal to heaven breaks off. The petals begin to fall in self-forgiveness. It is a flower. On the mountainside, it is dying. I keep reading that poem again and again. It has a charm to it as well, um, like, like this mountain. Um, so, so many artists have been drawn to this mountain. It has a lot of history around it. Um, Throw visited it four times. Um, there was a painter I found named William Preston Phelps, who for a good part of um, a decade painted the mountain from, you know, hundreds of vantage points. Um, and, you know, he, he had a family farm just in, just out in Chesham, which wasn't far from the mountain. And then, of course, um, I found a long poem by uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, titled Monadnock. It was published in 1847. He actually um, drops the K 
because um, probably to anglicize uh, the word. And in all 427 lines of this long poem, he, um, there's very little reference at all to native peoples. Um, you know, the, the indigenous peoples, and there were, there were a lot still living in the Northeast in 1847. Um, there's not a whole lot of, um, there's not a whole lot of description of, of the living mountain, of life on the mountain. In fact, most of the poem is just a sort of rah-rah, like America, colonial settlerism, and the mountain is sort of used as this like grandiose metaphor. And I have to say, <laughs> In, uh, in 2021, that falls kind of flat for me. <laughs> and so when I read that, I was like, oh, you know what? I'm going to write my own poem about <laughs> Monadnock. Um, and it's also going to be 427 lines. And, um, you know, it's not really a, a translation. I I've been calling it a revision. <laughs> um, the title of my project is actually Monadnock. Um, which I'll talk a little bit about later on, um, which comes from an Abenaki um, word root. But um, let me, before I start reading a few fragments from the project, let me read you one of the epigraphs from um, Nan Shepherd, which uh, comes from a book published in 1955 uh, titled The Living Mountain. For the mountain is one and indivisible, and rock, soil, water, and air are no more integral to it than what grows from the soil and breathes the air. All are aspects of one entity, the living mountain. That's a great little book, by the way. Um, when I started visiting Monadnock, um, it was in the winter time, and so some of these fragments kind of begin and follow a bit of a trajectory of the, over the course of the year. And um, the project's not finished yet, <laughs> which is kind of fun. You all are getting like a test run tonight, so so thank you. Here's a, here are a few uh, fragments. Monadnock. Ice crystals form on shrubs above tree line and the laurel look like bleached sea sponge under an ocean of dense gray cloud. One might think the frozen mountain sleeps. Under huge trees, still and forever green, white brushed and heavy only when the snows came, the mountain just a rock with ravens and hard winds carved ridge lines and the squall kept conifers small and gnarly, covered thick in spruce and fir. So the story goes, a man from Peterborough told Thro the mountain was once covered in thick forest before settlers twice burned the summit where ravens lift, dive, wind-shaped. Um, ravens come up a lot in this project and in this long poem, and I'll talk, I'll mention it later on, um, uh, kind of, you know, it's my spirit animal. Uh, I, ha I have a few tattooed on my body, um, and uh, it's, it's there, I'll, I'll tell you about it later, but if you hear the ravens come up a lot, they're there at Monadnock. Um, also studying this his the history of the mountain and, and trying to learn as much as I can, um, I happened upon an incredible book uh, that was published in 1884 in Quebec. Um, it's titled New and Familiar Abenaki and English Dialogues. It was um, published by <clears throat> a chief named Sozap Lolo. Uh, his alias was uh, Joseph Laurent. And this book um, is really, it's quite amazing. It's like stepping through a threshold of history, um, trying to explore the words and the language and the consciousness of a land as I'm, as I'm trying to do. Um, 
you know, I'm finding things in this book that are just miraculous and I haven't even begun to scratch the surface of it. Um, but, but words from the book are making their way into, um, these, this, these fragments, um, just a love for these words. And there's a pronunciation, uh, section at the beginning, um, you know, that gives you some of the rules. It, it gives you some of the diphthongs and, and it talks about how when two consonants are next to one another, th the sound is prolonged and um, every single consonant in a Beneke is actually pronounced. So when you see a PH, it's never an F sound. You actually have to pronounce both like pahanam, which means woman. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm trying my best to learn, but I'm, I'm so far from feeling confident but um, there aren't a whole lot of resources available and I'm, I'm going to continue um, looking and learning, but um, I just want to say that uh, this is still an attempt. <laughs> uh, what I also want to mention too is um, the name of the mountain. So the mountain today is named Monadnock, which actually is used as well in common geological vernacular to mean a mountain that stands alone, that's like an isolated rock formation. <clears throat> but in this book, um, in the back, there's actually a section of place names um, under etymology. And what uh, Chief Lolo actually talks about is how um, the mountain is actually named from Monadnock, uh, which actually means Silver Mountain. And um, so, of course, that's the the title of the project for me, um, which I had I showed you before. Um, and I just want to read you this one passage, which is the second epigraph to the project from Chief Lolo. Before commencing this treatise, it would perhaps be well to mention that all these names, either in Abeniki, Cree or other tribal languages, which now designate so many localities, mountains, rivers, etc., have been so much disfigured by the whites who, not understanding these words, pronounced them in the best way they could and spelled them accordingly, but in most cases with such incorrectness that they have rendered many of them altogether incomprehensible and thereby impossible to discover their true signification. I find it interesting how through words and language, it's a gateway to consciousness and it's a gateway to a collective consciousness of the people. Um, having just read that epigraph, I realized the great responsibility of writing a project like this, um, you know, bringing a Beneke language and words um, into it. And, and I, I guess I could, the only thing I could say is I'm doing it with great care um, and with uh, a lot of heart to learn um, and, and, and try to understand the history of a, of a place and of a land, um, which, which is interesting. When I moved up to the Northeast, up, up North Country, there's a, there are so many place names that, have, um, that are named after indigenous peoples and, and, and are indigenous words. And so you, it's almost impossible not to read and write about that. So here are a few more fragments. Words like rocks. In Abeniki, say kissos, sun, moon, and month together. Kezalompsen, both the wind, how it blows. The night, a place of here and thereness. Pogwasik, moonlight the many sounds of water. Call me Sibobi, river water, and I will come ancient with music. And remember to Salgonvi, rain water, for the way it brings sleep, the floods. On the silver rock that stands alone, no to Kabi, spring water, Nabisinbi, mineral water, Pibganbi, muddy water. I am no map maker, and this warbler song 
I cannot place to name. It has been a year since I heard him sing. What care can I give his solitude? Little messenger, untranslatable. Make me silent as the page, aperture of light, for the bedrock sees us, hears us, fills fissure with earth, sheep laurel, microscopic life. What's it like on the summit on, say, a Saturday? Like the county fair, he says. And I think of my obsessive urge to get away, escape, seek the path not taken, which is not a joyful poem. The speaker knows he will not come back. He is lying to himself. And here, instead we go. And maybe, maybe I say, the mountain wants to share these life energies. Give me footsteps that alight on the wind. The wind might be a good good thing to talk about. Um, it's almost always windy up on Monadnock. Monadnock sits about two hours south of Mount Washington, which has um, the highest recorded wind speeds and the lowest recorded temperatures in all of the world. Um, and, and the dip of the jet stream just blasts the Northeast and, and Monadnock's not far off from that. Um, and you could almost always expect 20 mile per hour winds at the summit. And in the winter time, which was when I started hiking, um, it was really cold <laughs> and um, windy and the snow was like windblown and almost iced over. And it was, it was pretty wild. You know, at, at times I thought it was on the moon or something. Um, and when I was up there, uh, there weren't a lot of animals. I'm always on the search for, for wildlife, except for one animal. There was one animal at the summit in the middle of all these winds and all this snow and cold. You want to guess what it is? It is the common raven. Um, the ravens live up there all winter long and they looked joyous. <laughs> they were having a grand old time. And I was just amazed at, 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 any animal that could live up there. And um, as I mentioned, you know, ravens are um, all over me. <laughs> uh, and so it, it's interesting they've made this their way into this project. Um, I'm going to read one final fragment. Uh, and before I do, I just want to say thank you all for um, listening and sharing in some of this new work. Um, I appreciate it. <laughs> Talks with animals, tells me, raven magic, do not try to understand it. There are powers beyond you. Raven medicine will shape inner being. That is, until the Jesuits come, and the English soldiers come, and the Puritans, who too denounced the primitive superstition of talking to animals. They wanted hide and fur and feather, souls. I hear spirit, Niwasku. I hear breathing, Nasuan. The voice, Lalomawogan, Kichukasas, Raven, Aboriginal messenger. May I call you grandmother, friend, companion. Speak with tongues given you song of call and awk that calls me now toward the long twilight of winter when hard snows cover this rock i know you will be there <laughs> thank you everyone thank you so much david that was wonderful mm -hmm. so i'm now going to um bring up isabel and escort david virtually off the stage but thank you that was just yeah. such a pleasure hi everybody um so grateful to be in this virtual space with you all and um, just want to uh, thank the Princeton Public Library. And um, I'm going to start off with some new work 
um, it's a series of poems, um, chameleon poems. And uh, I will start with chameleon or a poem with colors. It's strange to love that glitter shines under the right light after a person dies. My sadness isn't about with a pandemic. Their money is on the virus. Sometimes so is mine. I've made a living off being the underdog, life just a bit off balance to notice how I too much praise rays making a rainbow, always rooting for the streaming light. It's strange to love colorf colorful skirts and blouses on my skin after death. They help blending in with other walking, talking people in my neighborhood. Doesn't clue them into the big blue whale in the pit of my belly, drawing me down into deep oceans, crawling with life. I'm always the one that doesn't belong. 20 years ago, doctors admitted me to protect my body from my body. And here I am again, wanting to wade to the top, turn my flesh aquamarine, develop gills and push myself across waves with my great tail fin. Strange to love all my colors even more after the memorial. So I crawl beneath the sun and bathe under its warmth, hoist my belly up and disappear into every green tree. Some say the doctors got it wrong, I meld so well. Truth is I adapt, I shape shift, so perfect it hurts. It's strange to die over and over, peeling off layers reveals a woman distracting you with her skin. I wonder what she truly looks like, under it all? Is she still smiling? Are butterflies making a wreath upon her hair? Is she still dancing in bruised circles by herself? This next poem is about land, the land that we um, sort of takes, take space on and um, and just the idea that it's belonged to um, no one and has um, been around for ages and ages. Um, I'll just read the poem. It's a new, it's new work. It's called Let Me Come and Go. And the epigraph reads, this land has been around for ages, so it knows when to be nervous for itself. Ancient gods of brown earth live over and over while billions of humans try to rule. I'm here and in truth, there's fear that if I'm not in control, then something else is. The universe laughs because truly she's the only one with power. Me, just delusions of it. In truth, there's fear my whole life is a performance. Can I go back? capture childlike spontaneity, snatch it from my younger self and transform the future? In truth, there's fear and these ancient gods don't know a thing about it. They simply exist and pour fireflies into the night. I sit here and worry, missing the tiny bright lights. I long to dismiss this feeling, reach for pulsing shine, let it tickle my forearm as it flies up, arm hair like rising grass. To the fireflies, to the gods, to this ancient earth, I am a magical being myself, roaming lands freely, able to move about this world, little ghosts here, there, the not. It's true, in truth, there's fear, a minute hand ticking so quickly up against a garden bed or pushing past the leaves of a tree, turning colors, then dropping into the ground. Where there's truth, there is fear, but it doesn't mean it holds me firmly in the grasp of its cupped hand. I can fold it, place it deep under my breast and let it live with me until I don't. Then let it fly out and find comfort in another body on yet another day. The earth that stirs beneath bends to my feet even when I wish it wouldn't. 
In truth, let me come and go in a blink of a universe's eye, my own little light shining briefly amongst so many others. Let me twinkle mightily, but leave no mark upon this earth, gifting it as I found it, so others might enjoy the world's deep, long breath. In truth, next lifetime, I'll learn to float, hover above dirt, its great ancient bounty rising, rising, a little twig here, curling green there, up through the sky, pushing past baby blue, the gods watching, nodding, yes, yes. On time travel. Here I am time traveling again, and this time it's deep into the future where we've yielded the earth to butterflies and bunnies, cracked oaked and fields overcome with dandelions. We exist sparingly, covens of us huddled by crackling fires, trying to remember what paved roads looked like and daring each other to imagine the taste of cotton candy. I enjoy coming here when I ache, watching the way wild dogs run alongside women who look like me, black and brown bodies holding the earth sacred and ruling golden, their crowns peaking wisdom. The ground glistens under the sun, our rainbowed bodies bowing to each other in dance and play, and in praise of how pregnant the clouds seem, giving way soon to water. It will rain for days quenching flowers and ladybugs alike. I time travel here because hope shines like lightning bugs up against night, twinkling gems insisting, this is not just a speculative hope, but a sure bet. How else can I return to the past, to the present, to watering my garden with a hose that can't quite reach all the way past the daylilies, to the lonely frost that coats the grass, the doves that flap past the shrubs once the screen door slams, back to the me that barely exists until my name yelled shatters silence. Waking, sleeping, waking, sleeping, just to get to the part of my day when I soar years into my palm's lifeline and find a little heat pressed against my back. So um, during the pandemic um, in 2020, I um, married my now husband. So um, it was tricky. We had a small court wedding, but we um, we were in love and um, this poem is for my husband. It's called Teeth. My husband shares with me that moment he awoke from having his wisdom teeth removed and couldn't pull his eyes away from the scene. Bloody enamel lined up one by one by one, an altar of bone and jaw. He refused to believe that all these teeth were wedged in his mouth for all this time. Honey, you're a shark, didn't you know? For a very long time, you were the angry kind, mammal full of rows of teeth that chomped down on any living creature before him, circling a meal, devouring a small, frightful snack. Because that's what it meant to be shark, Correcting the wrong, swallowing bullies one mouthful at a time until you are the lurking, stalking thing that threatens. But I'm your wife and don't succumb to your sharp. I lurch, play with your massive snout, twitch my tiny fin tail towards stalks of green rising from the bottom of oceans. Our blues match each other, bantering through water, weaving around each other, creating currents that other fish swim through. We both know you cannot help being born a shark, row after row of piercing things pulling you like magnets across water toward blood. But there is something you can do now, chase delight, muscles untethering joy while swimming round and round playful strokes. You and I are both unlearning teeth's potential, delicate way they pose a threat, bludgeoning beasts turning over in waters to reveal a soft, majestic belly, smiling full and fast, 
awkward wide grin full of dozens of teeth beaming at salty horsefish who beckon God's good race. Proof that to be a man does not equate sharp tooth unhinged jaw, torpedo body pulling down its prey. Sweetheart, every fish you choose not to chew gives more grace to this world and gives us a fighting chance to teach ourselves how to forgive. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna read another chameleon poem or I am afraid after Dorian Lux. And this is also, um, about my new marriage. I am afraid. I am afraid of the changes, my shed skin lying in piles throughout the house after we exchange vows and make a pact upon an earth that is grief swept, that I will turn into a woman that cleans and cooks and never checks in with herself or, God help me, forgets how to write. I'm afraid that we'll realize that we are two remote souls who happen to love each other. And maybe it's okay to be lonely and want love, but shouldn't I carry fear, especially then? House it carefully in the corner of my brain so that if it breaks, I can tell myself, I told you so, because isn't that penance for being wrecked myself? I'm afraid of not being enough for you, dear husband, for your family, for myself. Disappointing us all in a cycle of self-doubt, so consumed by it that I drop everything in this role of wife. You would tell me there is no role, no servitude, no pleasing, just interdependence and compromise and love. This gives me hope. I'm still afraid. I'm afraid to get lost in love, a marsh of buzzing and still water, the music and quiet winding me around its natural metronome, unable to find my way out. I'm afraid death will take you too early, me morose and swimming in depressive quicksand, or worse, I go too early leaving you in a lonely island of liquor. What do I get to control? Maybe not the giving or taking, but holding your heart in my palm, all beating and raw, saying to it, I can be honest, I can be tender. I promise you all be brave. I chant over and over, I trust the universe, I trust the universe, I trust the universe, because I do. I'll read this next poem for tomorrow. It's called Dearest Wonder in the Sky. And the epigraph reads, um, it's from a, from a poem, An Education by Tamar Shabrizier. It uh, reads, to be a woman is to clot, forgive intrusion, as if God himself got you pregnant. This is not an apology. This is berating and payment for keeping life, clinging to it so meticulously, I discover loss. Where is my own bearing? A daughter, a son? You refuse to release them into me, my womb ticking, closed. Ego tripping, too busy staring into lakes, searching for your reflection, God, while I search for justice, a family I'm owed according to fables, fairy tales where the good prince princess births a blonde haired baby. But I cannot stay ma mad, God, dearest wonder in the sky. You're busy giving all the powers of the world to the white men who live in it, busy gifting rule and domination to mankind. While I scrounge for scraps, grateful I get any. I cannot stay mad, God, because these scraps are starting to transform into fruit, the kind that is sweet and sticky, comforting my belly and soul. A home with a man I love overpowering my desire for destruction. This is how you get us to swallow what you pour down our throats, even when it's from the bottom of the pitcher. You tease. 
Oh God, I want a God that listens, that turns his head in empathy toward my cries, laying hands upon my belly, proclaiming, it is so. And there it is, a tiny human growing within me, little image of us igniting quickly and forming into a bundle of joy. I want the happy God, because who doesn't? The one that loves, offers sympathy and speaks back, a voice on the other side offering more than silence. I'm not sorry because how can I be? As a child, I thought you were going to make all my wildest dreams come true, or at least offer your shoulder for my leaning head. It's true, I can find you in the ones I love when I am full. But what of when I'm empty? Dearest wonder in the sky, where do I look to find God then? This next poem is called Pandemic. The world is at the end of its smudge stick, nub trying to cleanse itself as it does every several hundred years, pursuing a blankness, that of untouched snow. I investigate this slate, a crime scene, hoping to uncover how sickness can beget wellness and humanity. It all smells like sage to me as people unravel, struggling to reimagine their lives without someone or with someone or just sitting in silence with themselves. Praise the subtle quiet, the nuances and breath pushing up against a mask, Praise our wonderment in reading each other's eyes as the sleeping mouth tucks itself under fabric. Praise time and the way it sloths, days blending into days. Praise friendships activated and friendships diminished. Praise the hungry spirit in you feeling trapped. No, there is not a thing I can say to change your life, but I am thinking of you, sending you all my best intentions. Praise those sending me their blessings, choosing lit candles over breaking glass. Praise my love who asks if I'm okay when I cough. Praise message threads that ding with joy and sorrow. Praise funerals that never happened. Praise grief. Praise healthcare workers. Praise virtual reality. Praise social bubbles. Praise the last hug you received. Praise the last phone call with the one you loved. Praise grief. Praise moving forward. Praise the wide, wide circumference of loss running through us all, filling our bodies like helium. Praise you hearing this, your aches, your joys, your own little prayers. Thank you so much for sticking with me. I know this is a long reading and I'll close with this last poem. One day, brain, we're gonna make it out of here, man. Riding on a black unicorn like nothing's about to stop us. Soaring over the people that said I couldn't be beautiful. Watch me now, shades rimmed with gold, chopped locks curling tight toward my face. Rosy cheeks filled with rushed blood and joy because this is the only way to live with fear, but flying out in everyone's face brazen, a sexed star who chooses twinkling and pulsing for her own sake. And I couldn't agree more, dear brain, that this world was never made for people like us, all combativeness and calculation, not that our magic doesn't make mischief, but we contain the quiet manipulative lobes from growing larger, massage olfaction and pleasant touch fuel our nose and fingers to imbibe wild, infuse raucous. We're plump with it, ooze with hope that dear brain will shoot out our bodies so damn fast, a rocket, death wondering how we fly so quick without his prompting. We were born to hover, made to last, but only amongst dust and rocks pitched in the black of night. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you sharing this space with me. Good night. Thank you so much, David and Isabel. That was wonderful. We were so grateful to have the opportunity to bring your work to people in this virtual setting. Um, I do want to shift gears now to the open mic. Um, and I'm going to bring up 
Philip Holmes. Um, we had one person sign up. And so I did want to just say, I think we have room for one or two more. If there's anyone in the audience who has one poem they would like to share, let me know in the chat um, and we can add you. Otherwise, um, we will just go with Philip Holmes, which will be wonderful. So I'm going to bring him up now. Um, so just bear with me. Okay, shall I go? Yes, please go ahead. So first, let me say how wonderful it was to hear David and, and Isabel's work. And uh, <clears throat> mine will be short and a little different. It's not so much about mountains and history and animals and marriage and a black unicorn. Wonderful ideas. I'm going to read a poem called Rereading Some Books and the surprises that one has in reading books that one has either loved or perhaps hated. Rereading some books. Even the shapes of their words seem distant as I go back, rereading books once known well. I find marginal notes left little to reveal. Whole chapters vanished, swept clean in an instant. Characters recalled have changed or are absent and already playing in different games. Stage encounters collapse on almost every page. Earlier conversations can never repeat. Raindrops batter the hydrangea's blooms until storms have passed and the winds die down. Hesitating over borders of fading haze, a world was transformed with so little care that memories failed under the weight of days. Now, little remains. What did I learn there? Thank you. Thank you so much. I now see that we do have someone in the audience who would like to share a poem. So Lynn, I see you and I'm gonna pull you up on stage to share your poem, just bear with me. Hi, I hope that you can hear me. Um, I'm so grateful for this opportunity, David and Izzy, thank you. And that last poem was really great. Uh, I'm gonna share a poem um, that recently appeared in Mom Egg Review and it's called Secretly in My Dream, I Knelt Down and Asked Them to Make Room for My Grandchildren. And it's after Mary Oliver. I was spending the weekend with my two grown children both in their 30s, one married, one not yet. Both told me years ago they didn't want children. I believed them then, believed that I understood each reason, believed that I would have plenty of other children in my life to share that love with. I knew it wasn't genetics that made me aunt to four great nephews of my dear friend and that the child of my niece feels just like my own. But really, looking at my kids this weekend, my joy in their familial features, my, de my delight in their unique ideas, their common habits, I longed right then for one of them to tell me they've changed their mind, that yes, I would someday be Nana, and that I would hold their child and see my eyes or hear my laugh, and the other one would say to me, Yes, they will birth the cousin, that our family will escape extinction for at least one more generation. This was only my dream though, and I only need open my eyes to remember. Nothing can die. And I asked them in my dream, I knelt down and asked them to make room for me. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I don't see anyone else uh, who wants to join the open mic. So we will end a few minutes early tonight. So another huge, huge thank you to David and Isabel and to our open mic readers um, and to you, the audience, for joining us tonight. We hope that you'll come to future poets at the library programs. Um, they happen four times a year. And we do hope eventually they'll be in person again. Um, please look at the library's website if you'd like to learn more about our other programs. Um, and we hope you have a wonderful evening um, and stay well. Thank you so much. <laughs>